folks, welcome to Weiss Advice, powered by BeatStars.com. This video is going to be a primer on reverb. But before we get started, gotta give a special shout out to Placebo Beats for supplying this record that I am using to demonstrate these ideas. Okay, what is reverb? Well, anytime we hear a sound, we usually hear it in some kind of a space. If we're recording, say, a drum kit, that drum kit is going to be not just the kit itself, but also the sound of the room that it is in. That room is going to create a bunch of very, very fast echoes, and that's going to give us the personality of the space. It could be something like a small live room in a studio, which is going to have a tight, clean sound, or it could be something like a tunnel or a cave that's going to have this bombastic, very colored reverb that's just hopping around. Every space has its own personality and it creates its own flavor and that's what we're going to be discussing here. Okay, I'm going to play this record and what you're going to notice is that there isn't a lot of reverb. Everything is going to sound very dry. It's going to be very tight, very punchy. And we're going to hear everything very clearly and it's going to have its own cool effect in being so dry but it's also going to lack size and energy. cool, but it doesn't have a lot of impact, it doesn't have a lot of expanse to it. So now I want to focus on the clap in particular. This clap sounds like it's in a dead room. It doesn't really have a lot of size to it, it doesn't have a lot of expanse. Now I'm going to add a reverb to it. Now it sounds like it's in this giant empty warehouse, right? Suddenly I've given it a space that it lives in and it adds energy and it adds size and fullness and character. Okay. So let's start breaking down the controls on a reverb. First of all, we have to sort of filter our reverbs into two big categories. We're going to have our algorithmic reverbs, which are all based on mathematics generating different echoes in different ways. And then we're going to have our convolution reverbs, which are actually imprints of actual spaces that are used to map what it would sound like to have our dry element in that space. Kind of cool, kind of quirky. For the most part, most of the reverbs we're going to be dealing with are algorithmic, especially in the digital world, but there's a few that are using convolution and those can be really cool. So I'm going to start with the algorithmic stuff because that's going to cover a lot of our bases. First of all, in any reverb, our main control is going to be the decay or the tail length. That's going to determine how long our reverb goes on for. Do we have a reverb that's just trailing on forever? This can be a really cool sound, but it's going to wash everything out. We're going to have sound that's just kind of masking everything and making things cluttered. So while it creates this very, very large sound, it's not necessarily good for all sources or all situations. On the other line of things, we could have a very short decay. And this creates the sense of a smaller space, a less extensive one that just adds a little bit of flavor or color to a sound without necessarily washing things out. And different things are going to call for different tail lengths. So for example, if we want this to have this big arena sound, then having the decay being as short as it does, uh, as short as it is, is not really going to be the way to go. That doesn't sound like an arena to me. An arena sounds more like this. Now, following the tail length, we also have things that influence the color of the room itself. In order to get the color and character of the room, we have to make some determinations about what reverb actually is, and this is probably going to be the most technically intensive part of any of the tutorials I've done here, but I'm going to kind of explain what reverb is. Reverb is a series of echoes that are very densely packed together, and those echoes are either di discrete or diffuse, meaning they're either very focused or they're very sort of broken up, depending on the shape of the room. So the size of the room is going to determine how far apart all of those echoes are, the diffusion is going to determine how dense those echoes are or how spread out those echoes are in terms of their actual sonic characteristics. And I'm going to demonstrate that because it actually makes more sense when we hear it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to space the echoes out as far as possible by turning the size all the way to the right. <laughs> 
and I'm going to make the echoes as discrete as possible by turning the diffusion all the way to the left. And it's almost going to sound more like a series of echoes or delays rather than reverb. Now, in order to demonstrate what diffusion sounds like, I'm going to start turning the diffusion up and making those echoes less discrete. What's going to happen is the sound is going to sort of break up, and it's going to start to sound more smeared as I go. As you can hear, the more I turn up the diffusion, the less we're able to identify every individual specific discrete echo. Now, size is going to determine the space in which these echoes live apart. So if I turn the diffusion all the way down, make them very discrete echoes, as I start turning the size down, all of those echoes are going to start getting condensed together in time. And as I get smaller, it starts to sound more and more like we're in some kind of a tin can or something like that. So the size is the spacing of the echoes, the diffusion is the density or focus of those echoes. And we can use them in conjunction to create a lot of different styles of reverbs. So for example, if we wanted to create the feel of like a lush open hall, we're going to want a pretty large size and we're going to want a lot of diffusion. But if we wanted something that was more like, say, the spring reverb in a guitar cabinet, well, we're going to want a lot less size and a lot less diffusion. Yep, sounds like a spring to me. So that's one of the ways that we can get different textures out of our algorithmic reverbs. Then there's other little things that we can use to sort of start qualifying the space. For example, if we've got a space that's like a big wide open cavern, then our damping is going to be pretty low, meaning our high frequencies are going to trail, you know, without too much difficulty. Can you hear how there's this sort of like shish kind of a noise that just trails on and on in this reverb when I turn this damping to the right? This would emulate a very uncontrolled space, one that doesn't have a lot of furniture, one that doesn't have a lot of absorption material. Now, if I were to turn the damping all the way down, That's the sound of a space that has a lot of absorbing materials in it. So something that has, you know, a lot of um, uh, insulation on the walls or something like that. Something that's more like a recording studio. And so if we want something like, say, a hall, again, we would go back to our high diffusion, our fairly large size here. And we're going to put in just enough damping so that it doesn't feel overly dead, but not so much that we have this high end that's just trailing on forever. There we go. Sounds pretty cool. Before wrapping this up, I want to discuss a couple other really important controls that we're going to get into a lot more in depth in the next video, but I want to touch on here, and that's going to be our location controls. The controls we use to determine where we perceive the sound in terms of the front to back imaging, meaning how close or how far away something may be. And these controls all kind of work in conjunction, and sometimes they're a little bit hard to hear the exact nuances of until we're hearing it in a complete construction of a mix, but they basically come down to the early reflections, which is marked as ER here, the late reflections, which is marked as wet here, and the delay, which stands, which is short for pre-delay. So anytime you're using any reverb unit, you're probably going to see something that reflects these controls, the early reflections, the late reflections, and the pre-delay. And together, those are going to give us our front-to-back location, and here's how. <laughs> 
The number one control that really determines how far away something feels is actually going to be the total amount of reverb. So if we have very little dry signal and we have lots of the reflections, late and early, something's going to sound far away. So the amount of reverb is the primary number one control. But once we've got the amount of reverb that we want, we can then sculpt it a little bit more using the early reflections, late reflections, and pre-delay. So the early reflections are the reflections that hit our ear first. If I remove the wet return and the dry return here, and I just isolate this clap with nothing but early reflections, we get this. And you hear that that sounds like sort of a washed out diffuse version of the initial clap sound, but it just sounds kind of like filtered strange. Those are those initial reflections that hit the immediate boundaries and then bounce right back. That's our early reflections. Our late reflections is what we more commonly associate with the reverb, and that's going to be this sound. but it's actually the combination of the two, the early reflections and the late reflections that makes up our overall reverb. Now, the further you are away from the source, the more late reflections we're going to hear and the less early reflections we're going to hear. The closer we are to our source, the more early reflections we're going to hear and the less late reflections we're going to hear. So in other words, if we want something to sound really in your face, we're going to have a good amount of early reflections and a lot less late reflections, and it'll sound more like this. Whereas if we have something that's further away, the early reflections are going to be proportionately a lot lower, and the late reflections are going to be proportionally higher, more like this. So in determining our front to back imaging, the first thing that we're going to look at is the proportion of our dry sound and then the proportion of our early reflections and late reflections. So here's the clap sounding pretty far away. Now I'm going to set the dry level up higher, the late reflections lower, and the early reflections higher, and this would be more accurate to how the clap would sound if it was close. Now, the last thing in determining how close something is is going to be the pre-delay. The pre-delay is the separation between the early reflections and the late reflections. It's not a delay between the dry signal and all of the reverb sound. That is a very common misconception. It is a delay between the first set of reflections, the early reflections, and the late reflections. And I can demonstrate that by turning the dry signal all the way down, turning our early reflections way up, our late reflections way up, and now turning up this delay, which is actually pre-delay, it's just labeled delay for some reason, pretty far up. So we hear the early reflection, a delay, and then the late reflection. This would be indicative of something that is very, very close. We hear all the early reflections first, and then we hear the accumulation of late reflections later. If we were to say take that all the way down, where the early reflections are now blending right in with the late reflections, this would be indicative of something that is further away. So if I were to put all of this together, if we wanted something that sounded close, we would have a large proportion of the dry signal, a substantial proportion of the early reflections, and much less of the late reflections, and I would have some pre-delay between the early reflections and late reflections. If I wanted something to sound further away, I would take the dry signal down, I would push the late reflections up, I might turn the early reflections down a little bit, and I would shorten the pre-delay.
And again, I'll be covering a lot more of this in the next video on world building, but I just wanted to give you the basic look at these controls right now. Now, the very, very last thing I wanna mention is convolution reverbs. There's not a lot to talk about, or the, well, there could be a tremendous amount to talk about because they're very technical, but a convolution reverb is more of like a map. It's less of something that we construct and more of something that's already been constructed. The way it works is that we create an impulse and that impulse acts as a map for what a sound would sound like were it to exist within the space that we got our impulse from. Confused? That's fair. Let me break down the way it works. Usually, to record an impulse, a person will go to an actual physical location and they will shoot off a pop gun or a blast of white noise, and they will record that with a microphone. So you get the sound of this pop gun in the space that we are looking to map. So maybe we go over to like a cathedral and we shoot off a pop gun and we record that sound. In the editing, we remove that first few milliseconds of the initial transient, the dry sound of the pop gun, and we keep everything else, all the sound of the room bouncing together. And we use something that's very broad band. This is why pop guns are popular, because they have almost a white noise-like response. Or we use short burst white noise to do this, because it literally is white noise. This gives us a map of what things would sound like if run through the convolution of that sound. So once we have our map, and a convolution reverb takes whatever sound we want to feed through it and generates what it would sound like had that been what was played in the room. It's kind of cool and it's kind of fun. The only little bit of a hindrance, like the, the sort of negative side of this, is that once we have that map, it is a recording. And so there's only so much we can do without losing sound fidelity. Generally speaking, when we're using convolutions, we want to get a mapped sound that is as close to exactly what we want as possible. Because the only way that we can stretch the time or diminish the time is to actually time stretch the recording itself. And that creates artifacts and we lose fidelity. A little bit of it is fine, but anything that we're doing to that map is ultimately taking away from the sound. The good side about using convolution reverbs is that they sound really, really great. They're really cool sounding, it's very realistic, and it can add a really wonderful layer to your overall record. So I've, I've pulled up a convolution of a um, really high-end reverb unit, and I'm going to play the clap through that. So that is a convolution of a really good algorithmic reverb, which is a little bit confusing, but now I'll jump over to say something like a warehouse. This is the sound of our clap in a warehouse. Kind of cool. Now we can go to say like a larger warehouse, something like this. more like a parking garage, but as you can see, we get a much more interesting, more textural, and more rich reverb than just going off of the basic algorithm. The problem is if we want to change it, it's only going to change so much before it starts to kind of fall apart. All right, guys, thanks for checking this out. Mm -hmm.